when I moved into this house, I, I, I didn't have the cash to, to buy a bed. So I thought, well, I'll use this as a chance to explore floor sleeping, do what the, do what the Japanese do in the, the tribesmen. And I did a silly video about it on YouTube and it, loads of people were writing saying this fixed my back pain and I, I feel so much better and so on. Do you have a particular recommendation on mattresses or I certainly think that sleeping on the floor is maybe too extreme. I'm sure there is a there's a point in the middle where you get the best of both worlds. But have you done much, much work into this? Not a lot, but I've done a little to have a rudimentary opinion. So there's a book by Bart Hex, H-A-E-X, and I forget the name of the book. I apologize for this. It's something like the ergonomics of sleep or whatnot. And he goes into categorization of body types and pain mechanisms and those kinds of things. So if you take, you, you mentioned Japan, the Japanese have typically a flatter back, a resting state. It's a rather flatter back. So to sleep on a futon, which is a bit stiffer and very flat, might be very comforting. If you were to ask someone with a lot more lordosis in their back to sleep on a futon, on their back, they would say, this causes me back pain in the morning because they've stressed their spine out of a neutral lordotic, which is natural for them, and they've flattened it. So they've been sleeping in stress all night long. Or they might be a woman who's quite curvy. So they have wider hips, wider shoulders, and narrower waist, and they lay on their slide and you see their spine is deviated quite substantially. And then you test them in your assessment, what triggers your pain? What's that end range of motion? So you see for them, the futon might be the thing that's causing the stresses that's causing their very specific back pain. Years ago, we developed a device called the prop air, which is an inflatable cushion. So a woman uh, might place it on her side and, and pump it up to tune for her. Yeah. Okay. Bingo. So this is like a pregnancy <laughs> pillow. Yes. Uh, anyway, so you're already migrating stress away from uh, a pain trigger. So th that's the first part of that. However, if you have a flatter back, probably a futon might be uh, very good. Now let's take another person and we're doing pattern recognition now. So let's take a heavier male, one who snores, that's part of the pattern, and they lay on their back. Now, some people will say, oh, I love the memory foam. And the next person says, oh, I hate the memory foam. That person, and I can prove this because we did a study through infrared, we monitored students and we put them to bed for, I think it was 34 hours. And we watched their spines swell over the 34 hours. When you wake up in the morning, you're a little taller than when you went to bed. As it turns out, the hydrostatic pressure through the day squeezes fluids out and the osmotic pressure of the disc sucks fluid back in. If you lay in bed, it keeps sucking up fluid to the point where your spine is now in stress. So we know this from space travel. The first 24 hours in weightlessness, you have grown about five centimeters in your spine to the point where your spine is under so much stress, many of the astronauts will take analgesics. Five centimeters is huge. It is, two and a half inches or thereabouts. But people do this themselves. If you get flu and lay in bed all day, you'll notice your spine is screaming, for the most part, if that's a, a sensitive pain so trigger for you. That That is so interesting because, so I, I was, a couple of years ago, I was hospitalized with, with a couple of infections and I had a sudden worsening of my back pain and I lost sensation and motor function of my left leg. Hmm. And at the time I thought maybe it's because of the systemic inflammatory response and that's just worsened in a pre-existing disc bulge, but it sounds like maybe just prolonged bed rest combined with a pre-existing bulge caused it to extrude and compress the S1 nerve root. Very much so. That's very possible. Anyway, this is why we would re remember that woman example who I said, what time did you get out of bed this morning? That's where my brain was going from that motivated that question. She has no chance to de-stress the pain mechanism because she doesn't get out of bed. She stays in bed longer than eight hours. So anyway, there's just an example. Now getting back to the, the pattern of the heavy man who snores on his back, they don't change position. 
they wake up in the same position as they went to bed. So memory foam conforms to their body and gives them support and supports the curves. Now let's take a fella like you or me. We're wiry types, not a lot of meat on our bones. A memory foam doesn't fit the pattern because we roll and change positions throughout the night. And to get out of a memory foam, you have to climb up out of the depression that you've made, which causes muscular work. And so my question then would be, do you have a sharp pain in your back when you roll over? And if the, if the patient says yes, I would say, lose the memory foam. It's the wrong bed for you. You would do better with a firmer base and a nice thick pillow top, which facilitates taking the stress out of your angular shoulders and hips and that supports the curves and, and this kind of thing. So there's quite a bit of science on this, but I've given you some of the science that we've done within the framework of studies like Bart Hex. And, and I think of uh, consults that I've done. There was a, a player in the National Football League. So I'm, I'm talking about the American Football League. This fellow was a fullback in the mid 200, so about 250 pounds, but quite a bit under six feet. And his buttocks were so large that if he laid on his back, you would see daylight under his low back. It was totally unsupported. But here was the problem. He couldn't have a roommate when they were playing together on the road because he couldn't sleep in a bed. He had to sleep on the floor. His buttocks were so huge that there was no, he had to sleep on his tummy on the floor and his teammates would trip over him or whatever. And so, I ended up building what we called the prop air. So it's an inflatable device and it filled up his low back. And for the first time, it allowed him to go back and sleep in a mattress. And uh, he was comfortable again because we migrated the stresses away. And I know I get criticized. People say posture doesn't matter. And, and I thought they haven't done the experiments because if you lay in bed, you will get discomfort if you stay in the same position. It might be on your shoulder, might be on your hip or whatever. If you lay in bed even longer, that discomfort turns to pain. Now, if you still don't move and migrate the stress away from that pain causing stress concentration, you will now get injured. You will get a stress concentration and a bed sore. So there it is, pain, injury, physical damage you got to migrate the stresses with a posture change. It's, it's non-negotiable that this idea of posture doesn't matter. It migrates stresses. Anyway, the principle is a scientific one, and it's applicable to uh, sleeping within the context of what the person's body type is. Do they snore? Do they change positions? What is their genetic make makeup and the natural curves? Where is the neutral zone? And the what we would call a position of respite. Have you been able to assess in that patient a posture that is totally pain-free? Now, do you have the coaching skills to coach them to show them this is your safe place to go? Now, did I just do cognitive behavioral therapy or was it uh, biomechanical coaching? It was everything. I love how I'm asking you do you know, have you done much work on this or do you know much about this your answer of not really but i have uh, i've got a bit of an opinion on it basically may, means i don't have a phd in this specific topic <laughs> but i've done a few studies and read a hell of a lot about this that is such a great answer about the about the mattresses and i think it puts it really into context for different body types so thank you for that do we have time for one more or should we wrap things up? Oh, I, we, we can do another one. I am mindful. I have to get my mind into world-class rowing here ah, in just enough. a minute. You might appreciate this. Do, do you know who I sleep with? Who my wife is? No. Oh, okay. Her name is Catherine Barr. She's a sports psychologist, which you can imagine the conversations that we have. I, I might see an athlete for their back pain, and then I find out that she's had a, a session with them, And but we never discuss individuals. <laughs> That's just a rule we have. But she also, she rode for Canada for our national team in the 80s, but she's picked up master's rowing about eight years ago. And since that time, she's been the Canadian champ, the American champ. Two years ago, she was the world champ. So I Family live- of high performers. I, my athleticism is very limited, but I live with uh, a warrior who psychologically will not allow someone to row through them. 
So you can imagine the, the soul that can produce that performance. But if you were to ever meet her, you, I have to speak for her because she would never in a million years indicate her, her championships and that kind of thing. And she's the nicest person on the planet until you go to the point where you want to row through. It ain't possible. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> so why did I get into that now? I, where were we headed with that? I'm oh, sorry. We, we were on the final. By the way, I, you realize I'm now going to get killed and I will pay for that statement for the next three months. <laughs> but uh, anyway, no, she's a fabulous woman. But We'll chop that bit out of the podcast. Just leave it. <laughs> um, so 